because we're in a series called Counter Culture. And I want to preach a message to you today before you go to blackhawk.fyi about counterculture humility. Counterculture humility today is where we'll be, and we're going to be in the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 8 through 18. And in this series, this is actually our eighth week, we're wrapping it up next week. We've just been looking at different areas where as Jesus went against the grain, we are called to go against the grain. We are called to not just talk about what Jesus said, but actually do what Jesus did. And you're going to feel like you're swimming upstream so many times when you do that. And today's message, we're going to be, as I promised you, looking at some of how we do that, even amidst some of the controversial, contentious topics that our world is just flooded with today. But we're going to need some humility to do that, and that's what I want to preach to you about. And it's interesting, Peter, as he wrote these words, 1 Peter chapter 3, he's writing to a group of first century people, first century Christians, that are under a world that is really driven by the oppressive Roman Empire. Now, in this time, Rome really was the America of the world during this time. Rome had the greatest military, had the largest economy, had uh, the biggest global footprint. They ran the show, and so many things about that looks like, feels like America, but it didn't stop there. They were also kind of in a self-destruction kind of mode. They were disintegrating, this Roman Empire, and even the world. There was divisions and contentions and conflicts everywhere. And those conflicts included things like racial conflict and political conflict and even regional infighting against each other, territories, nations were fighting, wars were were building. Does that sound a little familiar, by the way? It almost feels like history repeats itself, doesn't it? It almost feels like we as people do the same thing. We go through these cycles over and over. And when Peter wrote this, this is who he was writing to in that context. And I would say it's a pretty timeless word because we can find ourselves identifying in so many ways. So I want to do three things today with you, share with you about three parts of this passage. Number one, write it down, is countercultural humility, which is our title. And Peter starts in verses 8 through 12 by talking about humility because we're going to get to how we should respond and live a counterculture kind of humility in today's world. We got to start with knowing how we're going to have a basis of humility. Can I get an amen? You ready for the word today, church? First Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 8, Peter writes, finally, All of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you are called, that you may obtain a blessing. And then that blessing is described in verses 10 through 12 where he's quoting from Psalm 34, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about, but you could jot that down. Great devotional material, Psalm 34. He quotes and and says, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And you can see that this humility that is countercultural starts to overflow and spill into uh, a holiness. And to do all of that, we're going to need some help. And those are actually the three things we're looking at. But let's talk about this countercultural humility. Verse 8, he says, finally, he's summing all this up. So these are like parting words. They're super important. You don't want to miss them. And he says to them, all of you, finally now, all of you. And here's what that means. That means this passage, you can't get a hall pass and skip class on this one. That means it is for you. There are no exclusions. Look at your neighbor and say, this is for you. Let them know because they may not know. Or they may be asleep. Make sure they're listening. This is for all of us. No exclusions. And then he gives this list. This list of five things that really ultimately build up to a humble mind is the fifth one. But let's talk about them one at a time. Number one was unity of mind. He talked about unity of mind. Um, Unity, listen, is not uniformity. The oneness that you see described in Scripture with the body of Christ and the kingdom of God is not sameness. Oneness is not sameness. In fact, look around. Look at your neighbor. I dare you to find someone who looks like, acts like, thinks like, believes like, politically uh, acts like, whatever, and even smells like you. Uh, We are all very, very different. And that is the beauty of the kingdom of God. The beauty of the kingdom of God is that we are all so different and we come from so many different backgrounds, yet we are one 
in Christ Jesus. We have this common thread that ties us all together. In fact, did you know there's really only one type of, of thing that results when everybody, when everybody believes exactly the same and we're completely in alignment, nobody disagrees with anybody about anything. There's, there's two things. I'll add one. Number one is heaven. That's going to be nice. But that's not real just yet. But oh, it's coming. Come Lord Jesus. But until then, the only thing that you'll find in this earth that truly has everybody completely on the same page all the time about everything is a cult. <laughs> and until we are together and one in Jesus, we'll disagree on things. We'll, our differences will clash. Our differences will collide. Yet Peter's saying, if you want to have this countercultural humility, you've got to have unity of mind. Secondly, he says you've got to have sympathy. Sympathy. And sympathy turns into empathy where I care about how you feel. I try to understand. I seek to understand your perspectives, even though I may not agree with them or like them or whatever it may look like. I care about you. So I put you first, and then I empathize. I try to feel with you. Where there is no sympathy, there is no humility. There will never be humility. They, they do go together. If you are humble, you'll be able to sympathize. You'll be able to put others first. But until then, we won't. The third thing that's listed there is brotherly love. That means I treat you like family. It's, it's, a, it's not the kind of love where it's like, hey, I, yeah, I love you. Now please go away and never bother me again. This is the brotherly love where it's like, oh, you drive me nuts, but I love you, and I'm going to love you no matter what, all the time. We are family. Unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart is the fourth thing he lists here, and we need a tender heart. Some of us, sometimes our heart gets so hard. Life can harden your heart, and Satan wants nothing more than to give you a hard heart, because if you, don't, if you have a hard heart, then you will never have humility. Hard hearts are never humble. But humility, but humility can soften the hardest heart. A God-driven counter-culture humility can soften even the hardest heart. This is a willingness to listen and to learn. And I want to help you. I've given you these four words before. These are four words that will change your life, and they are at the heart of humility. You ready for them? Here they are. I could be wrong. If you don't say that sometimes, chances are you're not living a real counterculture kind of humility. I have to say this all the time. In fact, with Jessica, I often change this word. I say, I am definitely wrong. <laughs> but this is a good preface, even if you think you got it, to maybe, even if it's about Scripture. Sometimes, listen, we get so dogmatic and we think we got it all figured out, but the more I read the Word of God, the more I realize it's living and active, it's alive, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it, it pierces to the depths of my heart, and sometimes it pierces through false understandings of things I thought I had figured out all of my life. So I could be wrong is a good starting place. And then verse 9, he talks about works and words. He says, don't repay evil for evil. This is works. This is eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Uh, or reviling for reviling. This is your words. And I heard a pastor say a long time ago, when we live with the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth mentality in life, we're going to all end up blind and toothless. If you don't believe me, look at social media. You see a bunch of blind, toothless people, it seems, just going at it all the time. And we are not exempt from that even as the church. And listen, all these verses, they were written, listen, before social media. How much do we need them now? No reviling, no eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, and a humble mind. And then verses 10 through 12, he quotes from Psalm 34. Great song. You should read the whole thing this week as some devotion material for you. Psalm 34, this is what Peter is quoting. Anytime scripture quotes scripture, you should probably listen twice. You should doubly listen. And that's exactly what Peter is doing. He's quoting from the Old Testament. And this psalm is a great psalm about even humility. And he's talking about the character of Jesus. And Describes, I wrote them down as five promises that, that we see even listed in verses 10 through 12. Is that we're going to love life, see good days, enjoy peace. We're going to have answered prayers and God will deal with evildoers. Now raise your hand if you could use a little of those promises and blessings in your life. I'm telling you what, me too. But this is what Peter describes, countercultural humility. Proverbs 15.33 reminds us that humility always comes before honor. But I would also remind you that humility always comes before holiness. That's number two. Write that down. We talked about countercultural humility. Now let's talk about number two, countercultural holiness. Holiness. 
verses 13 through 15, and we're really going to camp on verse 15 because it is truly an answer to how we can live a countercultural humility in a holy way. But listen, so many times, don't miss this, we think that holiness is a me effort. And I came to tell you today, holiness is a he effort. He does that through us. How many of you are holy apart from Jesus Christ? Don't raise your hand because you are not. We are all sinners and we fall way short of the glory of God. Notice the order of this. Peter's transitioning from humility, this list of things, now to how it overflows, how humility overflows into holiness. Let's go to verse 13. He says, now, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? Here's the holiness part. But if you should suffer for righteousness sake, and you will, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Woo, we could preach this for a few hours. I'm going to try to do it in just about 15 or 20 minutes or whatever, you know, give or take. So let's talk about verse 15. But to do that, let's go back to verses 13 and 14. We see that you're going to suffer. It's almost like Christ knew what he was talking about when in John chapter number 15, where he said, hey, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you too. And then he was right in John 16 where he says, hey, in this world you will have tribulation, but you can take heart because I have overcome the world. And so he says, Peter is writing to us, don't be troubled, don't be afraid of the them when you surf, suffer persecution, when you suffer for trying to be zealous, for trying to pursue what is good, what is holy, and what is right. I found there's two ways to get in trouble as a Christian in today's culture. You want to know what they are? Number one, do something wrong. Do something wrong. First of all, all your, your friends, or, or you thought they were, they, they'll quickly turn on you, right? Sometimes the real ones stick with you. But even more than that, when you do something wrong, we displease God. And if I displease God, it doesn't matter who I please. But if I please God, it doesn't matter who I displease. So number one way to get in trouble as believers today is do something wrong. Number two way to get in trouble in, in today's culture as a Christian, do something right. When you do things right, Peter's telling us, Jesus has already told us, it's going to hurt. People aren't going to understand. It's going to go against the grain. It's going to be counter culture. And so that's what Peter is talking to us about. And he's asking this question and helping us process this question. Okay, well, how do I not let it be something that overly troubles me? How do I not live in fear when it happens? And then in verse 15, he answers it. But before I go to verse 15, we're going to camp there. Man, I believe it's going to just be powerful for all of us this week. Some of you are suffering right now. Some of you, it's because you've done something right and you're being persecuted in different ways. You're trying to stand for truth and and it's been hard for you to do that and you've had people coming after you. For some of you, it wasn't because of that at all. It was just an, an unforeseen set of circumstances, a loss, you're in pain. But I've learned this about ministry, that most of the time, our greatest ministry in life happens through the seasons of our greatest misery. Our greatest ministry will often come through our greatest misery. So whatever it is that is hurting you the most right now, I believe God wants to take it and use it for his glory. He is so good at redeeming those things that make us miserable in this short little life we live on this temporary earth, in this culture, and do countercultural things in it and through it because he's going to do something in you so that he can do something through you. So my friends, look at me for a minute. Be encouraged. Be encouraged today. Whatever pain you're carrying, God carries not just your pain, but he carries you. Verse 15 is kind of three parts to it. And if we're going to not have tr- be troubled, not live in fear, the first part of this is that our hearts must honor Christ the Lord as holy. I'm talking about countercultural holiness. The word holy here is the same word that Jesus uses in the original language when he gave us what we call the Lord's Prayer. And he says, hallowed be your name, talking about praying to the Father. Hallowed be your name. Holy, same word here. Honor the Christ the Lord as holy. We often think holiness is about me, but we see right here, honor Christ the Lord as holy. You want to be holy? You've got to honor him as holy. You've got to put him on the pedestal. You've got to look to him and not them. What does he think of me? Not, do, not what do they think of me. You've got to make sure he is the most priceless. He is the most valued thing in your life. If you want to pursue holiness, you've got to be humble enough to view him as the holiest of holy. And that's what Peter starts with. And then he breaks it down 
even further. And he says, as you sanctify Christ, setting him apart as the most valued, then there's two parts at the end of verse 15. Always being prepared, he says, to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. The word defense is apologia in the Greek, and it's where we get our word apologetics. There are apologetic studies and, and courses in seminary that I took and that we've even offered around here where you can learn to defend your faith. And that's the, where we get this concept. And a few things stand out. First of all, some of you are like, yes, that's exactly right, and so you should be. We should stand for truth, and we'll get there in just a second. But notice it says, for anyone who asks you. How many of you talk sometimes when nobody asked you? <laughs> Anybody? I do that sometimes. It gets me in trouble most of the time. Nobody asked me, but I just, I'm going to say it anyway. And are there times where maybe you should speak even when no one asks? Absolutely. Are there times when no one asks that you shouldn't speak? Absolutely. Do we as Christians get ourselves in trouble sometimes where we get become keyboard warriors and speak even when we shouldn't or we should have paused first? Absolutely. But I'll tell you, let's take it a step further. Someone should be asking you. If you're demonstrating countercultural humility and countercultural holiness, someone should be saying, like, okay, like, we just both went through the same thing, and your reaction is way different than mine. Why? You shouldn't be smiling right now, but you can't wipe that weird grin off your face. It's almost annoying. Why? This is them asking you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Anybody asked you for that lately? That was convicting to me this week. When was the last time I was around people that maybe don't already have or understand that hope? Am I putting myself in proximity to them? And, and am I living it in a way that they look at me and go, wow, I don't know what that dude's got going on. And he's a little weird. But I think I need to know more about it. Somebody should be asking us. So, so here's the thing. There's two parts to that. And some of us are like, yes, that's right. I'm ready to make a defense. I'm a truth warrior. And so we should be. But Peter didn't finish the verse yet. What does the last part of the verse say? Yet... Do it with gentleness and respect. That word gentleness is the exact same word in the original language that Paul uses in Galatians chapter 5 in the list of the fruit of the Spirit. Gentleness is a part of that fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. This used 11 times in the New Testament. It's used as uh, gentleness or meekness or courtesy. It's describing this, this humility. This humble posture of mind and heart that's displayed in grace in the power of strong character. I preached on this word in our Fruit of the Spirit series, and we called it fearless gentleness. <laughs> because really in the world, we think of meekness as weakness. But in Scripture and in Jesus' life, write it down, meek is not weak. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is the power of God through strong character, demonstrating and living out and standing on the truth, but doing it in love. It's truth and it's grace together. But listen, we live in a culture. We're in counterculture series. We live in a culture that says you got to pick one. It's either or. You either stand for truth or you show grace. But my Bible says Jesus did both. And I want us to talk for just a minute about how we show that kind of gentleness and meekness in a world where two things are going to happen to you in this world. First part is you're going to encounter people who just don't have the biblical morals that you hold to. You will have people in your life, I hope you do, we're called to. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. It's, it's not the, the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. So hopefully we've all got people in our contacts that, that, man, they don't know Jesus. And when that happens, yes, there will be times where your view of morality and life, and yes, it bleeds over into, I'm going to say it, into the politics and into all of the things that, that we talk about and discuss and what makes the world so contentious today. There are going to be times where we're not after the same thing. But that's where we are to love in such a way that those who are not after the same things, holiness that we're after, they're not after that, but they see something in us that makes them go, I need to know a little bit more about how you think because you're weird. You're kind of annoying sometimes almost. I want to know more about that. That's where, so that's going to happen. But here, I want to talk because Peter's writing to a group of Christians. And I'm talking primarily to a group of Christians today, I hope. And if not, guess what? God's got your number. He's calling you. He wants you to be a part of his family today. But I'm going to zoom in on Christians into our religious circles for a few minutes. And here's what I believe. Here's what I've found. There will always be wolves in sheep's clothing uh, in our church and in the global church. There will always be people who are not after the same thing that we should all be after. But what I've found in our religious circle is that essentially all of us are after the same thing. 
And we think we're divided because we're not after the same thing. But I've found, as I've dealt with Christians all my life, I've been in the church all my life. I had the drug problem growing up. They drugged me there Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every time the doors were open. That was my drug problem. And I've been around Christians all my life. And I've found that we essentially all really want the same thing. If you're really a believer, we all want holiness. We want, God says, be holy for I am holy. And we want to be holy. We want to honor God. So it comes from a good place in most cases. It's not every case. But where our opposing parties arise within our religious circles, politically, doctrinally, denominationally, it, it comes when we pursue holiness in different ways. What I found is it's often not what we, that we want different things, but how we pursue them that divides us. And when we pursue holiness through religion, through self-righteousness, we start to define things and add to the word of God, and we start to become pharisaical and legalistic. And before you write me off and say, well, that ain't me, it can happen to every single one of us. And I would argue it has happened to anybody who is called Jesus Lord because it has happened to me. We can all become Pharisees, and we can all start pursuing holiness by our righteousness, self-righteousness, and not his righteousness. So what can bridge the gap, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. What can bridge the gap in our dividedness, in our division? That's not even a word. I made it up. I'm going to make up another one in a minute, too. What can bridge that gap in our pursuit of holiness? I think it's humility. I think it's gentleness. I want to talk about that for a few minutes and make it really specific to a lot of things we're facing in the world. We've read from Philippians 2. My brother read from Philippians 2 a few minutes ago. But verse 4 of Philippians 2, talking about the humility of Christ, says this, that we are to look not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. I brought my illustration. I remember today, went to the grocery store. I got an illustration. I need your help. You guys ready to help? This is a two way illustration. A two-part illustration means I have a part and you have a part. You ready for this, Dave? Let's do this. Can you see this? Uh, I remember, by the way, I've used this illustration one time a long time ago, a few years ago, something like that. And Callie, I had, uh, you'd be glad to know, your pastor usually has a, a Bible out when he's preparing for a sermon. I had my Bible and a can uh, out. And Callie, who was, I don't know, six, seven years old at the time, said, what are you doing? Why do you have, why do you have a can in your Bible? That doesn't make sense. And she asked, fair question. And she, she's, I told her it was a sermon illustration. She said, well, are you going to tell them that they can do it through Christ? <laughs> I am not even kidding, y'all. It was awesome. So Callie, she's probably going to hate me for that you know, because I'm going to use it all of my life as I keep preaching. So, yes, you can do this through Christ who gives you strength. But that's not my illustration. So let's talk about this can. First of all, we talked about unity and humility. Is this a can? I need your help. Okay, it's a can. I agree. I think it's a can. I th so that's good. Hey, we agree. Already, look, we're already defying the odds. We agree. This is a can. Um, what kind of can is it? Like, what is, what's in it? Tomato sauce. Mm. I didn't hear that, but it's, I guess it was good. I don't agree. I mean, I do, I'm looking at it, and it says tomato. I see tomato on here two or three times. Um, it says ingredients, you know, it's got tomatoes. I think tomato has something to do with this can, but I don't agree it's tomato sauce. I, I just don't know how you could be so dogmatic about it. And, it, you know, it says garlic powder. Um, how do I know it's not a can of garlic? I mean, it's on the list. Why, how do you know it's tomato sauce? Why are you so sure? Well, it also says calories. I don't know. It's not a can of calories. I just got a different perspective than you. Well, how are we going to resolve this, guys? Because this is a problem. Well, we could open it up. That's a good one. Or what if I just... I see it now. No wonder you thought this is a tomato sauce. It says tomato sauce on the front. But, you know, back here, look, look at my perspective. I don't say tomato sauce anywhere on there. But listen, listen, this is what we do. This is what we do. I've learned that people, there, there are so many stands that people take that I don't agree with and I can't even understand. I can't grasp how they could ever get to such a conclusion. Say amen if you agree. We agree on that too. It's a can and we agree that that happens. But I've learned that people always take stands in life based on what they have seen in life. And I have learned that humility, considering the interests of others, I've learned that that means sometimes getting up. Cor Corbin Miller, you guys remember when he preached a little while back and he talked about moving our chair? 
and sitting where others have sat. Getting up, this is another way of saying it, getting up and walking around to another person's side of the can, you might realize, even if you don't agree, even if you don't come to the same conclusion, you can at least go, you know what? I could see where you would get there, but man, I've never gone through what you went through. I never experienced what you experienced, but man, that has shaped, your experiences have shaped your beliefs, haven't they? Hey, come over here. Come on this side of the can. Come here, guys. Let's look at it from my point of view, too. Can we both do that and understand each other? Wow, you know, this is starting to sound really biblical. Tomato sauce theology. It's powerful stuff. But when it comes to a divided culture, the more we walk to the other side of the can, the more we're going to look like Jesus. Because listen, friends, believers in the room, when believers fight with believers in front of unbelievers, everybody loses. This is why Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer, why he prayed for our unity first. That's why Peter put unity of mind before he even got to humility of mind. We're not going to be unified until we can start to bring some humility together. And here's some of you, and here's, here's what Jesus said to his disciples before I get to some specifics. Mark 9, 35, Jesus got his disciples together and he sat them down and he was talking about success and being first. And he says, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last, the servant. Of all. That means I move my chair. That means I walk around the can and look at things from your perspective. This is what Jesus did. He who knew no sin, that was his side of the can, became sin. That's our side of the can. So that we could become the righteousness of God. I say we try it. I say we give it a shot in life. And you might just be surprised at the doors and the relationships that God gives you to speak truth. It's a different way to do the same thing. You thought you were just speaking truth when you were just posting it and being angry and all those things. But maybe, just maybe, this is a better way. And today, you, some of you said, like, hey, I thought, Pastor, you are going to talk about specifics. I'm going to do that now, but here's the deal. We couldn't get to these specifics until we covered this stuff. We had to get to the tomato sauce theology until we could get to some specifics. So I want to cover some things. We've said all these things before, but I'll start by saying this. This season, these last few years have been... The toughest season to be a pastor, and I'll tell you why. It's also the toughest season to be a leader. And all of you lead somebody. All of you have kids or grandkids or you have influence at work or influence in one circle or another. And here's what I'll tell you. In this time, we politicize every single word. Every single word. And I'll show you. And I want to propose a new way. This year, and I say this not to garner sympathy at all. I've had people curse at me. I've had the meanest emails. I've had, I, I thought I was going to get hit one or two times over these last couple of years. I'm not kidding. Uh, and I say that not looking for sympathy. I didn't sign up for safe. I signed up just to preach the word and stand for truth and do it with grace. So I want you to know that it's a hard time. And you know what I'm talking about because you've lived this too. And it's easier just to hide. Easier just to just be, hide away. And it's a world of isolation. And so a lot of us have done that. And we're staying there because we just don't even want to face this world. I get it. But here's what has happened. I've noticed it. Um, I want to propose that we change. Here's what we do. Instead of every word, let's not politicize. Let's, I'm going to give you a new word. I'm going to create it. You ready? Let's kingdomize. Let's stop politicizing every word and let's kingdomize every single word that comes our way. Here's what I found. Uh, if I were to talk in these last few years about passion for women, it's like, oh, he's from the left. Uh, if I talk about passion for the unborn or sanctity of life, oh, he's from the right. Passion for minorities, oh, he's from the left. Or, or passion for first responders, he's coming from the right. Passion for immigrants, he's coming from the left. Passion for veterans, he's coming from the right. Passion for the poor, he's coming from the left. Passion for biblical marriage and how God is find it always coming from the right passion for it yep I'm going to say the c word COVID you ready for it passion for loving our neighbor in ways that includes having COVID protocols and precautions which we've had always coming from the left passion for fearlessly pursuing our call to gather and make sure we continue the mission of the church oh he's coming from the right you guys see where this is going and you know don't you because this is the polarized politicized world that we live in today but here's the result when we politicize every word and look at things through those lenses, we end up getting discipled by a political ideology rather than a kingdom theology. We abandon tomato sauce theology. We abandon the, both the message and certainly the methods of Jesus. And we end up, we'll talk about the message of Jesus, but do nothing with the methods of Jesus. And that is what God has called us to do, where it becomes less about sides, more about spirituality. And here's the truth. Here's the truth about all these things, the, the, the blue and the red and the Republican and Democrat and the this and the that and the opposing contentious things that we go through. The truth is that we make all these things an either 
either or, but God says it is a both and because I have spoken to every single one of those issues and I did not stutter. I have made it clear. And so let me give us a quick overview in case you wonder. And I'm sorry, for those of you who are new, I'm, I'm kind of animated because this is our family meeting. But you're invited into it. And if you're new with us and you're maybe not sure about churches, this will give you a good glimpse at what we believe and how we want to approach all of these hot topic issues. So I made a, a list. Are you ready for this? Everybody take a deep breath. We need humility. Here's, here's what I'll tell you today, that God values and calls women as is seen in how Jesus called them to be a part and lead in the early church. God is undeniably pro-life as the creator, sustainer, giver, and taker of life. Not only did God form every single person in his mother's womb and her mother's womb, he knew all of the works he had for them before they were even born. God created marriage. God defined marriage as a covenant before him and between one man and one woman. Yet with all of this, God teaches us how to deal with things like homosexuality and abortion and any other thing that doesn't align with his commands by taking us to Romans 3 that teaches us we are all sinners and all of us fall short of the glory of God and we who are without sin can cast the first stone of condemnation. We're all condemned and Jesus is the only hope for the world. God affirms authority uh, in our lives, calls us to respect first responders, veterans, even government and those who serve and lead us. At the same time, God condemns discrimination, racism of all forms, any form of partiality, and calls us to act as God's church as the imago Dei, the image of God. We bear the image of God and we view everyone as such. God cares for the poor. God cares for the oppressed. God cares for the immigrants. He commands us to do the same. He, he ordains nations and patriotism while calling us first to our allegiance being for his kingdom, to be kingdom people, people who seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, and, and his righteousness and all these things will be added to us. God also commands us to love our neighbors. And yes, that can be applied by making sure that we wear masks or take health protocols to give preference to others, even if we don't want or believe it's any good or even a help, so that we love our neighbors and protect against viruses and COVID and those types of things. At the same time, God commands us to not live con confined or consumed by fear, but to live a life that is built on humility and holiness and boldness for the kingdom of God and not to live in fear of what could happen, but know that Jesus is coming again. And until he does, we live fearlessly as we love our neighbors. That means that God is Lord over the masked and the unmasked, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, the lost and the found. God calls his church to be a melting pot of unity in a culture that is divided. We are called to be a picture of rest in a restless world. We are called to embody both truth and grace in what is an age of outrage. Just to name a few. <laughs> but boy, you could add to that list. And here's what I'd say to you about all these things. Write this down. That in culture, in a culture that divides, Jesus calls his followers to embody countercultural clarity and in all bold there. Should be underlined and circled and all kind of stuff. Clarity and compassion. John chapter 1. Verse 14 tells us about Jesus. It says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. We are called to embody countercultural clarity. That is truth. And countercultural grace. That is compassion. A world constantly tells us, culture constantly tells us, pick one. You either call sin, sin, and stand for truth, or... You love like Jesus loved and show grace. I say Jesus did both. This is not diplomatic. This is not politicized. This is not wishy-washy. This is not lukewarm. This is Jesus. Jesus is the full embodiment of grace and truth. And when it comes to standing for truth and showing grace, it's not a choice of either or. It is a both and we are called to have countercultural truth and countercultural grace in every sense of the word. Countercultural compassion while we stand for countercultural clarity. 
This is what God has called us to. And you're like, wow, it's a lot easier just to pick one. <laughs> and you know what? The world agrees. But we're not called to be of the world. We're called to stand out. Such a bridge of love <laughs> and such a divided culture is going to take number three. We've talked about countercultural humility, countercultural holiness, and a lot of other things. But to do all of this, we're going to have to have number three, countercultural help. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Like, woo, we need some help if we're going to do this. Let's read verses 16 through 18. We're going to need some countercultural help. Peter writes, here's what you get. Here's the help you get. Here are the benefits. Here's what God's going to do. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he may bring us to God. I love that help. Being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. I need some countercultural help from on high, some supernatural help help if I want to be counter-cultural. And I'll take you to chapter 5 of First Peter, it's verse 6. Uh, it's not on your screen, but here's what it says when it comes to countercultural humility. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes today as we have talked about countercultural humility, countercultural holiness. We know we need some countercultural, some supernatural help. And believers, I believe some of you right now, God has stirred inside of you something, a next step, a way, a relationship, a venue, an avenue to be more humble, to swallow some pride, or to better yet, put to death the pride that has been pulling you away from looking like Jesus, a way that you can embody countercultural clarity as you stand for truth, at the same time embodying countercultural compassion and being a person of grace like Jesus has been for all of us. Whatever your step, pray and ask God in this moment. I'll pray for you in just a moment. But some of you are here today and you would say, if I were to die today, I just don't know that I would spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. Don't know that I have a personal relationship with God because of Jesus. And boy, my conviction has been that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. If that's you, in your heart to God right now, would you pray something like this? Say, Jesus, I need you. I give you me. Surrender my life to you. I base my salvation on you and not me, not my works, nothing else. I know you died after living a sinless life for me. You died that brutal death on the cross. I know you rose again. Will you save me and forgive me right now? In your own words, let that be the cry of your heart wherever you're at, and you shall be saved. Will you respond to him right now in these moments? Believers and those who are maybe entering into the family of God right now, let's come together around what God is doing in our hearts.